Hey everyone, it's Darren DeVivo and welcome to Things We Said Today. This is a podcast about the Beatles, anything and everything about the Beatles together and apart. Um, we try to keep it bi-weekly, a uh, show every other week, a uh, different topic, a different guest interview. Uh, and for this show, we're going to talk about a new release. Um, I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City. I've been uh, part of WFUV for 40 years on the air um, for 40 years at WFUV. And it's also a pleasure that every other week I get to hang out with these guys and talk about my favorite band, the Beatles. Um, you know, Ken Michaels, Ken's been in broadcasting uh, actually a little longer than I've been. And most of his decades in broadcasting have involved Beatles programming. These days, he's the host of the syndicated show, Every Little Thing, which he'll tell you more about that at the end of this program. Um, he's also the host of Ken Michaels Radio on YouTube, which is chock full of uh, special guest interviews. And he's the co-host of another video podcast, just like this one, Talk More Talk, which deals with specifically the solo Beatles. Ken, it's great to see you and a belated happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. And uh, just want to say a big thank you to everybody who follows the show who sent me birthday wishes. I can't believe how many I got on Facebook. I can't believe I know those many people. <laughs> but uh, it, it really, my heart was pounding when I, I spent the weekend away in Massachusetts, where, by the way, I saw Roger Daltrey in concert and he was phenomenal. Wow. Came I couldn't believe all the, the messages I got on Facebook. And uh, it, it means so much to me that you all thought of me and wrote something. And some of you sent, uh, um, you know, Beatles photos and all kinds of things related to the Beatles. And, um, you know, it just, it, I, I'm so flattered, you know. You're that, verklempt I, right now. What's that? You're verklempt right now. Yes, very verklempt. So, so uh Thanks to all of you for the, the cards and, and letters and postcards and things. And right. I really appreciate it. And uh, really, uh, I felt 20 years younger. <laughs> I'm finally now getting to write back to some of you. It's taken me a while just to recover from the weekend. But right. thanks to everybody. Well, Ken, again, happy birthday. And, uh, of course, our other host, Alan Cozen. These years... Uh, all the focus is on a series of books about Paul McCartney, the McCartney legacy, potentially five volumes when all is said and done. Volume one came out a couple of years ago. Uh, the McCartney legacy, volume one, 1969 to 73. Alan and Adrian Sinclair. And I have to mention Adrian because Alan is uh, writing these books with Adrian Sinclair. Volume two covering the years 1974 to 1980 will be out on december 10th you can pre-order it now though alan's been writing uh about music for i think longer than ken's been broadcasting and i've been broadcasting for years with the new york times and these days you could read things uh that alan has written although mostly his work is now concentrated on the the mccartney legacy but in the wall street journal new york times etc um alan cozen it's uh hi alan <laughs> hey, Darren. Hey, Ken. Happy birthday. And hello, Thanks. everyone. So uh, today's show is going to be a look at the recently released One Hand Clapping. Uh, and I should have brought my prop with me. It's upstairs. But Ken has his. Alan has his One Hand Clapping. It's exciting because it's a new Wings album in 2024. <laughs> Never thought that would happen. Hmm. But it has happened. And we're going to talk about one hand clapping uh, in just a couple. But before we do that, uh, let's go over to Ken for the Beatle news. OK, then a lot has happened since our last broadcast, including news about Paul uh, continuing with his Got Back tour with six states. First of all, uh, this is what was first announced. Um, six states in South America. Uh, with shows in Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, and Peru. Originally, he had five dates scheduled, but he added a third date in Argentina. And just a few days ago, he added two dates in Brazil, 
October 15th and 19th. And he just announced recently he'll be doing eight dates in Europe in December from the 4th to the 19th, beginning with two concerts in France, then two in Spain and four in the UK, uh, two of which are in Manchester, the last two at the O2 in London. And since the news of the European dates, he also announced three dates in Mexico. Um, and that's beginning November 8th, ending November 17th. That's in Monterey and Mexico City. Interesting that he's not playing Liverpool as of yet. Um, his website says, keep an eye out for more news coming soon. Add up all these dates. And so far, you'd have 19 concerts from October through December. Since we're talking about one hand clapping on the show, it debuts at number 74 on Billboard's album charts. And also in the UK on the official album charts at number 10. So Paul has a top 10 album in the UK with one hand clapping. Count Paul McCartney as a Taylor Swift fan. Paul attended Taylor's concert. Uh, Sunday at the Wembley Arena, and he was seen dancing in the aisles to the song that kicked off her Eras tour. But Daddy, I love him. So count Paul McCartney as a Swifty, a Taylor Swift fan. Well, this appeared in the Mirror. You might have heard about this. Pete Best has reached out to Paul McCartney, wishing him a happy birthday, but with a little bit more of an intention. He's asking if he could open for Paul when he plays in Manchester this December. He says, happy belated birthday, not far behind you. Reach out if you'd like me to open for you in Manchester. Imagine. Now that would be something. Huh. You think Pete knows that Paul has a song called That Would Be Something? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> that would be wild. If that, if that I mean, that's also, I don't know, that kind of puts, we hear this, we think it's a great story, kind of puts Paul in a weird space, because if he doesn't respond, some people will think, oh, you know, but I guess there's no reason why they couldn't do something like that. That but, would really make big news. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Wow. I don't know. Good for Pete Best. Hmm. Also, it has not been confirmed yet, but rumor has it that four actors have been chosen to play the Beatles in the upcoming Sam Mendes biopic on the group. Um, they are considered to be among the best young talent in Hollywood. Harris Dickinson, tapped to play John Lennon, is known for his roles in The Kingsmen and The Iron Claw. Paul Mescal, rumored to play Paul McCartney, will soon be starring in Gladiator 2. Barry Cogan, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, reportedly playing Ringo Starr, made his name with Dunkirk and Saltburn. And Charlie Rowe, rumored to play George Harrison, appeared in the film Rocket Man. The biopic will be a four-part film event, and each film, we've been hearing, told from the perspective of each band member expected to start production next year with the release in 2027. Remember that Sony has yet to confirm the casting news. The August issue of Uncut Magazine has John Lennon on the front cover with articles on the Mind Games box set and a sampler CD with nine cuts from the new archival release. I was calling locally to see if, if uh, any stores near me had it. Not yet. My Barnes and Noble said possibly this weekend. Right now on John Lennon's really? YouTube channel, there are many fantastic videos that you can watch in preparation for the upcoming Mind Games box set, which is due out July the 12th. One of them is an artist, Ed Fairburn, who was commissioned to draw composites of portraits of John and Yoko each with a map of Liverpool over John and a map of Tokyo over Yoko. Ed tells you how the whole process the whole process of how he does this. And it will even include a Liverpool treasure hunt based on the date when John met Paul, July 6th, 1957, and the various locations that led to the historic meeting. And this will be a bonus feature on the limited edition box set. There is also a video that was made for the song You Are Here, 
which features never before seen footage from John and Yoko's art exhibit at the Robert Fraser Gallery with cameo appearances from Derek Taylor, Victor Spinetti, Richard Dolello, Neil Aspinall, Kevin Harrington, and others. Also, a 12 inch vinyl acetate of the songs Give Peace a Chance back with Yoko's Remember Love, was gifted from Yoko and Sean to the Salvation Army Strawberry Field, this ahead of the record's 55th anniversary. It was just unveiled in Liverpool, and it's one of only 50 limited edition records given to charities by Yoko and Sean to raise funds for the Salvation Army's Step to Work program. The mission director of Strawberry Field, Major Kathy Versfeld, Vers Vers told BBC Radio Merseyside, it's a real privilege for us here at Strawberry Fields as part of our work we do across the country and this place that John seemingly loved to frequent to be able to unveil it and to invite the general public to come and see it. The Step to Work program helps people with learning dis uh, difficulties or other barriers to help find employment. Each rare record is stickered, uniquely numbered, and features a machine printed signature from Yoko herself, making them highly collectible. Julian Lennon is on the front cover of the latest issue of the magazine Love and Life with the title Honoring His Parents and says Julian Lennon dedicates projects to his mom and dad underneath that title. And Julian's new book of photos called Life's Fragile Moments is due out October the 29th. We have an update on Revival 69, the concert that rocked the world about the history of the live piece in Toronto concert, first released as a video on demand in 2022. Uh, the article that I read said that it will be out digitally and in select theaters on June the 28th, that's this week. And uh, our own Darren alerted me to the fact that he has found out, I guess this was on Amazon, a DVD release date of July the 2nd for this. In addition to John and the Plastic Gunnel Band, the film also includes many 50s icons like Little Richard, Bo Diddley, uh, Gene Vincent, Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry. Also, The Doors are in there, as well as Alice Cooper. I haven't seen locally for me in Connecticut a listing of any movie theaters running it, but if any of you watching this video right now or listening knows of uh, any um, movie theaters in the country, or in the world, for that matter, where this is showing. That's the information I have. June 28th, it should be showing in some movie theaters. <clears throat> and we'll pass that along to you if we find out anything on our Facebook page and probably in the um, description box for this video. From our good friend John Bazzini, we learn of some upcoming books on the horizon, including John and Paul, A Love Story and Songs by Ian Leslie, due out April 8th next year which you can pre-order on Amazon UK. Also due out the same date is Yoko, the biography from David Sheff, known for interviewing John and Yoko in Playboy in 1980. We also have some information about Midas Man, a movie that you've heard about for several years on the life of Brian Epstein. It just had its Canadian premiere at the Toronto Jewish Film Festival on May the 30th. The film stars Jacob Fortune Lloyd as Brian, Jay Leno actually appears in the film playing Ed Sullivan. Uh, Studio POW and American Entertainment Investors sold North American distribution rights to Briarcliff Entertainment. So hopefully we'll find out more about that very soon. The new album from Billy J. Kramer is now out called Are You With Me? You may have seen him at the Fest for Beatle fans performing songs from the new album there. The album was recorded at Abbey Road Studios and Lawrence Juber co-produced the entire album with Jeff Perholtz. Ten tracks in total. One of the songs, I Couldn't Have Done It Without You, is a song all about Brian Epstein. And a new video was made for it with old footage of Billy and Brian. Very loving words throughout the song. Steve Holly drums on that track. So you have Lawrence and Steve, a Wings reunion there on the song. And Ringo's team, Ringo's team of Mark Hudson, Gary Burr, and Mark Mirando do backing vocals on that song as well. Billy also covers John Lennon's classic Jealous Guy on the album, which for many years he has done in concert. Two of the songs are written by Billy, and production on this is stellar. You can listen to all the songs 
from Billy J. Kramer's new album on YouTube, the album called Are You With Me? Also, Brian Ray has just released a brand new album. It's called My Town on Wicked Cool Records. One of the songs is now available as a video to watch on YouTube called When the Earth Was Round. And a really good rocker there from Brian. And just before we started to record this show, Darren, let me know about something that he discovered. Some of this news is brought to you by our very own Darren DeVivo here. <laughs> As he discovered that Born to Boogie, that's the film that was directed by Ringo, all about the phenomenon of T-Rex, um, is being released on Blu-ray. And this will be on September 27th. It's one disc. And as far as we know, so far, it's strictly Blu-ray. We haven't heard anything about uh, a DVD. And this is from, well, uh, Darren got an email from a company called Townsend Music. And there's a way you can actually pre-order the Blu-ray. Is there information you can uh, share with uh, our listeners there? Yeah, it, it was an email blast from Townsend Music. And you click the pre-order button. And it takes you to a page that has uh, a lot of T-Rex titles that they're selling, uh, including Born to Boogie. Uh, and I'm looking at it here, trying to see if it says anything about uh, being any any limitations on region, uh, on being able to watch it like here in the U.S. And I don't see anything. Um, it's listed at $23 uh, out September 27th. Um, the Blu-ray, it says the 2024 edition features a newly designed O card. Isn't that cool? You're getting a new O card. Um, you're getting the motion picture Born to Boogie, the original theatrical trailer, uh, the premiere version, the matinee show, Telegram Sam 2016 promo video, huh. uh, newspaper cuttings gallery, additional extras. Uh, and then they repeat everything again. Somewhere else it said something about outtakes from Apple Studios. Um, and then they give you the set list of the matinee show. So uh, it looks as though it's been on disc in the past, maybe out of print. Uh, but now coming out again, September 27th. Uh, the label is Edsel. Uh, Edsel Records. So it is originating from from Europe, UK perhaps. So go to Townsend Music, Google them, and then I'd say uh, you probably search around for T-Rex, Born to Boogie, and should be able to find it. And I think we'll have links posted yeah. down below. I'll put it in the description box. Yeah, so you could maybe use the links and track it down. So that, that just... Uh, uh, I just saw that today. So that's brand new. Yeah. I haven't watched Born to Boogie in a while, but it's a very enjoyable film. And there's even I've a... never seen it. I really know little to nothing about it. Hmm. There's a little, it's a brief jam with Ringo and Mark Bolin and Elton John in there. So I'm looking forward to seeing it again. So many of those Ringo films I haven't seen in quite a while. Uh, but, um, now we have more of a reason to see Born to Boogie. Also, a few more things. Congratulations to our good friend Jeff Slate, who will be opening for the yeah. Lounge. Way to go. Uh, there are select dates in Boston, Providence, Ithaca, and Newton, New Jersey, where I used to work at a radio station, <laughs> WNNJ, and I was their music director. Anyway, um, yeah, and the dates are on my website if you want to check them out at kenmichaelsradio.com. Those four dates, Boston, Providence, Ithaca, and Newton. Okay, Jeff, who just released a brand new CD. Um, and the legendary Paul Anka just released a new cover of Imagine as his latest single. And you might even recall that Paul sang Imagine on New Year's Eve on cnn's broadcast of new year's rock and eat oh that's right so you can actually listen to it on youtube paul anka who still sounds phenomenal 
for his age. He's, I think he's the same age as Paul McCartney. His voice is fantastic. Um, and we should end on a high note. Our very own Darren DeVivo and Dennis Elsis, two legends of radio together. They will be hosting um, the exhibit for Paul McCartney's Eyes of the Storm, which is currently running at uh, the Brooklyn Museum. This is a WFUV event. I said that because I just have to say the call letter is WFUV since Darren says it so much, but I never get to say it. It's a WFUV event, and it'll be on July the 11th. And, of course, that exhibit runs through August the 18th. So if you want to see Darren and Dennis together, that's the perfect opportunity. Yeah, it's um, I, I know that there are very limited tickets um, and they're I think we're about halfway sold out. Roughly go to um, WFUV dot org slash Paul photos to find out more. So what's going to happen is it's going to be an after hours private tour um for fuv members and other people who buy tickets and dennis and i will be there and then once the tour is done uh we'll go to the uh, museum restaurant for drinks and and uh chat away about you know what we just saw i guess so it should be fun thursday july 11th brooklyn museum uh mccartney's uh, photo exhibition exhibit exhibition I always get mixed up on what the proper word is with these exhibition exhibit. So, um, so that's July 11th, WFUV.org slash Paul photos. Okay. That's all the news I have. That's it. That's all. I think that's, that's, and, uh, well, before we, we start talking about one hand clapping, I do want to, uh, just briefly tell you a bit about um, my recent excursion to England, um, which was instigated by the New York Mets. Now, Major League Baseball, um, for the I think it's the third year in a row, uh, had a series in London. Uh, before COVID, I believe it was the Yankees and Red Sox played a series. Uh, and then um, uh, last year, I think it was the Cubs and the Cardinals. This year, two games between the Mets and the Philadelphia Phillies at London Stadium, uh, which is a stadium used for soccer, sorry, football uh, today. It was built um, for the Olympics that were in London, I think, in 2012, something like that. I'm probably wrong about the year, but. London Stadium was built for the Olympics when they were in London and the Mets and Phillies played two games there. So when that was announced uh, over the winter, this past winter, you know, got the ball rolling. My my wife has family that live in the uh, in England near London. And uh, it came together as a nice little family trip. We went to both Met games. The Mets were. Emba well, embarrassed is probably too strong a word. They were non-existent in the first game. The Philadelphia Phillies won, I think, something like 7-2. to two. The second game on Sunday was a very thrilling 6-5, come from behind, hold on by the skin of their teeth victory for the Mets. Um, uh, and it was fun seeing a baseball game played in England, uh, a soccer stadium transformed into a baseball stadium. Um, it turned out to be a week vacation, and while there, of course, this this was the third time I'd been to England, and the other two times, got to incorporate visiting Beatles sites, right? So, um, my honeymoon in '94, we were in England in December '94 for two weeks. Now, my wife used to, when she uh, was growing up, she used to live in Wales for a time. Went to high school in in England in High Wycombe, um, and again, she still has family there. So, our honeymoon, we went there in '94. And that's when I went to Abbey Road for the first time, walked the crosswalk, saw the Apple office uh, building on Saville Row for the first time, went to Liverpool for a couple of days. And then uh, after that, it was the second trip, I think, in 07. Uh, and I had the privilege of going, being brought on a private tour 
of Abbey Road Studios inside. Uh, and there are photos buried on my Facebook page of our visit uh, inside Studio 2 and Studio 3. Um, and back to the Apple office building and, and all kinds. This time out, though, um, because of where we were located, I realized that we were a stone's throw from Henley on Thames, where Friar Park was located, and that we would be going to East Sussex, where a uh, family of my wife, uh, they, they live. And it was a half an hour drive from, I guess it's considered a village of Icklesham, which happens to be where Paul McCartney's recording studio is located, Hog Hill Mill. So uh, pilgrimage to both locations for me. Uh, Friar Park was interesting because it's right smack in the middle of this uh, this English village that is not a very small, uh, sparsely populated place. It's a rather happening little town of shops and um, several main streets of lots of activity and tea shops and restaurants and right smack in the middle of Henley on Thames is Friar Park. Now you don't really see anything except it's kind of walled off walled off. It's kind of walled off. Uh, and, uh, but there are signs Friar Park to your left. And so we went to the main entrance, got some photographs, which was cool. Um, that's, uh, that's a site that's often been visited by, Beatle fans, and you can see lots of pictures outside of Friar Park. <clears throat> and then when we were in East of Sussex, it was uh, to Hog Hill Mill. That was more of an adventure, uh, finding Paul's recording studio in Icklesham. Uh, it's gorgeous. It's the English countryside, rolling hills. The English Channel is visible at a distance. And again, we were able to walk on the hill. Uh, where the mill is located. Uh, Paul wasn't there. It was very quiet. Very quiet. Very quiet. The English countryside, the silence is deafening. Uh, but uh, my wife and I walked right up to the, practically to the building, the, behind the building. There's a public pathway mowed into the hill, uh, into the grass. And uh, at some point soon, I'll put pictures up on my Facebook pages of, uh, of both visits. So those were very cool to get very close to, you know, where George lived, where I believe Olivia still lives at Friar Park. And I think, and um, standing outside uh, Hog Hill Mill and just thinking that pretty much almost everything that Paul recorded, starting with some of the stuff that went on tug of war, definitely by Pipes of Peacetime, was recorded in this very quaint, round building with a windmill on top uh, that um, was built in the 1700s. Um, so that was fun. And I'll share some photos soon on Facebook, and I'll make mention on our page when those are posted if you want to go look around. Uh, so that was a little... Thing that I got to enjoy in my recent trip to England. Anyway, I'd love to see the pictures, and uh, but you didn't get to see the pathway where um, the Beatles drove up for when they were doing the no uh, songs. No, it was. It, I mean, today there is nothing. I mean, you could look at everything today with Google Earth, and you could actually from from above look down on Friar Park. It's fascinating. Uh, the grounds, the gardens, the mansion, which is really nowhere near the street of, you know, the neighborhood, the town. It's in the grounds, deep in the center. Um, and as is the case with Paul's studio, if you know what you're searching for, you're looking down on a windmill. That's what it looks like from above. It's a round building. There is a, uh, a dirt road. I mean, the roads are all very narrow. If anyone's been to England, especially if you're driving in the country. I mean, you're talking roads. They're two-way traffic. But these roads are barely big enough for one car. Uh, but they navigate these roads. The speed limit on some of these roads was 50 or 60 miles an hour. Um, but it was one of these uh, paths 
it was a dirt path and you could see where it was uh there was a gate that was locked and that was the path i think that was going to the main entrance we went around the back where there was a little spot where a couple of cars could park and there was a gate letting you onto the grounds it was public walkway hmm. uh cut into the grass went right over the middle of the hill right behind uh the windmill so it it's open to the public so um yeah, I'll share those photos, and if you want to share if anyone else has has gone gone by. You want to share your recollections? That'd be fun to read. All right, very good. I hope someday when I go back to England, because I only spent one trip there, and that was in ninety one. That was the one where, it, as soon as I landed in London, I found out about Paul doing dates. <laughs> <laughs> and at the mean fiddler and on all my plans changed from the from the moment oh. I landed. But um yeah, I'd I'd love to visit that just to see it from the outside. It would be fascinating. Yeah, uh, for, uh Henley on Thames is like a suburb of New York City. Uh if anyone's listening and watching from say Westchester County, it's an a quaint little village that has a uh, has a, a a little bit of an urban feel to it, but it's it's still, you know, a village outside of not too far from London. Uh, Icklesham is out in southern England, East Sussex, and is very, very residential. Beautiful rolling hills, like I said. Uh, the, the English countryside's gorgeous, very green, very quiet. Nothing. <laughs> uh, so that's that. But so enough of my yapping with the with my travels to to England now almost a month ago, not quite, but three, three and a half weeks ago. But anyway, uh, today the topic of this show is um, one hand clapping. You know about this documentary that was uh, 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 several days wings spent at Abbey Road Studios. We know about it because it nearly became a documentary back in 1974, 50 years ago when it was filmed. Uh, these sessions were filmed and recorded, and nothing really ever came of the one hand clapping project. As the years would pass, some of the uh, songs would get released as bonus material, uh, some of the footage, video footage as well. I don't think any of us saw this coming, though, that it would be a full blown live in the studio album, double album, double LP. Um, I think the CD is, is a one disc or it's two discs as well. Cause I don't have CD yet. It's two discs. It's two discs. Mm -hmm. So who would have thunk it that in 2024, uh, we would get a wings album. Um, one hand clapping Paul McCartney and wings. Let's talk about it and start with Alan. Now, Alan, of course, writing the McCartney legacy volume two coming out on December 10th has probably got, a lot of behind the scenes and backstory to one hand clapping. There it is right there. Actually, the first first session is uh, here. <laughs> um, yeah. The timing actually is very interesting as you get ready to publish volume two. Uh, and now this comes out and now there's a renewed focus on these sessions from August 74 at Abbey Road. Yeah. That you know, now we know so much more about it. Can't wait to read the details in the book. Yeah. I never thought of it as a documentary. I, I mean, the, the film and audio from it has been pretty widely bootlegged over the years. Um, so it's around. Uh, and it really is just filmed rehearsals, or I should say videotaped rehearsals. Um, because as you remember, this is in August 74. In uh, June, in the first half of July, they were in Nashville. And the reason they were in Nashville is because, um, you know, Jimmy McCulloch joined pretty much during the sessions for the McGear album in January. Uh, and they were still looking for a drummer, and they actually had formal auditions for a drummer and they got Jeff Britton um, and Paul decided that he wanted 
the band to sort of, you know, play in, you know, get to know each other, you know, almost as if they're starting from scratch again, except that now they do have a repertoire, you know, several albums worth. Uh, and uh, they, they now, you know, Paul wanted eventually to get on tour, you know, uh, I mean, he, he did tour with the first version of Wings in Europe, but he still hadn't played in America and that was a big thing for him. So they go to Nashville for about a month, a uh, little more, I think, maybe six weeks. And they rent a farm house uh, with a, a, a big shed where they can rehearse. And the idea was that the two new guys, Jimmy and Jeff, get to learn all of the Wings repertoire that had already been recorded. Uh, and also there are some new things sort of in the works, you know, uh, Junior's farm had apparently really been started before they left. And it's kind, it's kind of curious because Curly Putman who owned the farm that they were staying at was known colloquially as Junior and Curly <laughs> and two nicknames. Uh, sort of like Arthur Two Sheds Jackson, but he was you know, too nicknamed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, but Paul had started the song earlier in it, and um, Jeff Britton remembers it being part of his audition in England before they went to uh, to Nashville. I mean, probably without the words, it's possibly that the Junior's Farm part didn't turn up until they got there. Anyway, they're rehearsing all this stuff. The trip was pretty much a disaster in, in, in certain ways and not a disaster in other ways. I mean, uh, the, the, the playing apparently really came together, but there were a lot of uh, personnel problems. Um, Jimmy had um, taken up Henry McCulloch's previous role as being the person to say, you know, really mean stuff to Linda and make her cry during rehearsals. Um, and Jimmy had, you know, some other, some other issues and basically, you know, they're getting to know Jeff. And the funny thing about this kind of the chemistry was that, you know, Jeff was really into karate and, uh, because of that, he was also into sort of physical health and well-being. And so he was also a teetotaler, whereas everybody else in Wings was, let's say, not a teetotaler. <laughs> um, they didn't total their tea. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy totaled a car while they were in it. Well, it's all in the book. Um but they, you know, and they recorded Junior's Farm, they recorded Sally G, they uh, actually did a, a bunch of stuff in Nashville, brought it back to England. And then, you know, the next thing was Paul wanted to see how this band looked um, and get a better idea of how it sounded than just, you know, being there and, you know, maybe listening to cassette playbacks. So they went into Abbey Road Studios. They had, uh, you know, Jeff Emmerich engineering, um, you know, multi-track recordings, uh, which we're now benefiting from because the sound on the new release is incredible. <laughs> you know, it's a really good sounding record and uh, far better than you would get the impression from the bootlegs that it was going to sound. And... Uh, but basically, he wanted to see how the band looked. And so he hired this guy named David Litchfield. David Litchfield was not actually a filmmaker. Uh, he ran a sort of artsy photo magazine, which just a few months earlier had decided to devote part of an issue to Linda's photos. Um you know, of all kinds, you know, not just of Paul and not just in Scotland, you know, but her drawing on her whole, whole portfolio of rock photography. Um, so, um, so he knew Litchfield. They were both, Linda and Paul were both friends with Litchfield. They asked Litchfield if they, he wanted to shoot these rehearsals. 
And he said, sure. And for some reason, he hired a Umatic video recorder. Umatic, for those youngsters in the audience who won't remember this, was a format like way before VHS and beta. It was a cassette, um, but it was big. Um, and the problem with it was that you couldn't edit it. So Paul, you know, it, it, it served the purpose for what Paul originally wanted, which was just to sit back and watch the band after they recorded these performances in Abbey Road. Um, but Litchfield and Paul then had this idea that maybe this could be a TV special. I don't think they were using the word documentary then. It was just like, this could be a Wings TV special. So God edited it. Can't edit Umatic. What you had to do was tell a scene it from tape to film, edit the film, and then send it back to the tape. And that's why all of the bootleg versions that you have seen of one hand clapping look so crappy. It's not mm -hmm. just because they're bootlegs. Um, it's, it's that you have a pretty serious loss of quality through the whole process. Okay. So Litchfield took these, the, the edited version of the film to the BBC and said, you know, here's our, uh, you know, new Paul McCartney and wing special. You, probably want to show and they watched it and they said are you out of your mind you know <laughs> we can't we can't screen this you know but the thing is it's you know it's it's kind of a nice little special showing this band that has really just been rehearsing for a couple of months playing playing really good tight rocking versions of these songs plus paul playing some things of his own you know on his own either at the keyboard or on guitar they had a, a a second sort of a subsidiary film going as well where paul took litchfield out to the backyard of abbey road and um they just filmed litchfield and his team he had a, a couple of other guys uh, just filmed paul with an acoustic guitar playing a bunch of songs out there and uh, some of which are included in this and six tracks from that are included in the uh, on the seven inch that came with the LP version. Okay. Um, so I can't remember where, where it was going, but yeah, you know, they, they filmed the stuff. BBC didn't want it. Um, well, the reason I guess I don't think of it as a docu documentary is because in documentaries, you have things happening other than just people playing music. This is sort of like a live in the studio concert, you know, with a documentary, you would, uh, you would expect to see some shots in the control room and Paul saying, no, I don't think it should be like that. It should be like, you know, uh, all of that, but there's nothing really documentary about this except that it captures this interesting period um, after Nashville and before the recording of Venus and Mars. So there's the historical perspective for you. A question I have uh, for you, Alan, uh, involves the the personnel issues. Mm. I mean, Jimmy McCullough has been in the band for a few months, same thing with Jeff Britton, and it seemed as though, <clears throat> from what you're saying, that problems were already... <clears throat> popping up between Jimmy and the others. Yeah. And, you know, you'd think about what would happen if I had that opportunity to play in Paul McCartney's band. I would not be making his wife cry. <laughs> you know, I would not be, you know, uh, getting into skirmishes with my bandmates. Right. It's a wonder that Jimmy lasted, what, you say about three three years and change as a member of the band and um i've always gotten the impression from things i've read through the years that jeff Britton was not a perfect fit like square peg in a round hole with the others um but you know so, you know it, it didn't bother paul and linda particularly you know that jeff was a teetotaler and had his karate thing and um you know paul was was fine with it um 
Jimmy and Denny Lane got a little bit clicky, you know, and they were the inner group and Jeff was the outsider, you know, and they made him feel that way. And, uh, and there were, you know, like Jimmy got into a car crash in in Nashville. He got arrested. Uh, Paul had to sort of get the Eastmans to call in a lawyer to get him out. Um, and by the time Paul returned to England, he was seriously thinking of just scuttling the whole band because he was, you know, he was – you know, he 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 didn't need another version of a band that would have Linda crying, you know, because they're criticizing her playing. And, um, you know, and he didn't need the infighting. He, you know, I mean, with Jeff, he he also had Litchfield produce a film about Jeff doing in a in a, a karate match. They there was a, a big karate match in London between the British team and a Japanese team. And Sorry. He mm-hmm. watched and listened. Hey. And, uh, you know, and and not only did Paul have Litchfield produce that as an MPL production, but Paul wrote music for it. It's electronic. Mm-hmm. It's a little experimental and weird. But, uh, you know, that and that film is out there. I mean, it would be interesting to have that come out, too, now. Is um, that what was called Karate Chaos? No, um, I Empty Hand, I think it was called. Okay, because M- wasn't there a song that Paul wrote called Karate Chaos that had something to do? I, uh, I've seen the title listed possibly. before. But... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think that's any of the titles I've seen, but um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, where, where Jeff had a problem finally is when they got to... to New Orleans to record Venus and Mars. You know, they did some at Abbey Road, they did some in New Orleans, and uh, there were some things that Jeff just couldn't make happen, and that frustrated Paul. Uh, you know, but who knows? I mean, it, it could be part of that had to do with the pressure of, you know, being the outsider in the band and all that stuff. And anyway, there was there was a, one of the Venus and Mars tracks he was having particularly a lot of problem with. So Paul asked Tony Dorsey, who was uh, you know his a trombone player that basically you know did Paul, did the arrangements and toured with Paul uh, as you know along with Howie Casey and the others. Uh, asked him if he knew any drummers and he didn't actually know Joe English, but he had seen him play once and all the other drummers he called weren't around. So he got Joe English and Joe English flew to New Orleans and the rest is history, so to speak. My question in all this is if in the very beginning, Paul's intention was just to make a film to see what the band looked like Mm -hmm. um, at some point, they were thinking about making it a TV special because why else would you hire an orchestra for live and let die? Right. To back spend right. money, on all those musicians and also on my love, there was an orchestra. Yeah. But you know, yeah. Uh, even after that though, even after the BBC rejected it, he brought his recording of Babyface, which is on the album to new Orleans with him and the brass band, on that is a New Orleans band called the, you know, Tuxedo. Can't remember. Yeah, they're credited. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he, he got, he got them to add breast to Babyface for no reason that we can discern because the TV special had already been rejected. Uh, Babyface was not going to go on Venus and Mars. I suppose it could have been a B side, but as it was, Nothing happened to it until right now when this album came out. And it's, you know, it's a pretty hot performance, actually. It's very good. You know, uh, I mean, we've heard Paul do Babyface because it's one of those songs that he keeps bringing up, you know, at sound checks or uh, I think, isn't there a version of it on Trip in the Live Fantastic? No. No? Okay. No. I, I must be thinking of just, you know, sound checks that I've heard you know, where he does that. He's done it in other, uh, 
It could also it could also be thinking of um other bootleg recordings of uh of the one hand clapping stuff. But uh but it sounds so much better on this than any of those bootlegs that I've now sort of you know put them out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing that's noteworthy here is that even though a lot of this stuff has been around and in fact there's six songs that were already on the band on the run box set and another three on venus and mars on that box set mm -hmm. and maybe i'm amazed was included on the first mccartney box set it, you're getting those songs in piecemeal that way but when you present it this way all as one release all tied together it just it really works so much better that way yeah instead yeah. of you know mixing it up with all the other bonus tracks and these aren't necessarily the same versions that he had put out as bonus tracks um, some of them have been remixed some of them are different takes some of them are different edits um uh people should well, look because i'd like to know myself yeah you know can you know which are different ones people should look do on, on on facebook on the mccartney legacy facebook page adrian okay. has done a this is page one and this is page two, and you see how small the type is. Adrian went through it and annotated what every take is and, you know, what's a different edit, what's the same edit, what's, you know, new. Um, and, you know, he's done it for all 26 tracks, not counting the backyard tracks that were on the seven inch single. Um, so you really, people should go look on the McCartney legacy Facebook page. It's really worth reading because it's a, it, it's a lot of work. I'm not going to, going to crib all of his notes here. I'll, I'll just refer everyone to the page and, and you can see his work. So that will actually explain that just randomly picking a song out of thin air, the version of band on the run, that was a b bonus track in the band on the run box set. It's a different, it very much a different take from what we have now on one hand clapping. Maybe there's another song, it's the same take, but there's uh, a different mix used. So that's all been chronicled by, by Adrian. Yeah. Let's see what he okay. says for Band on the Run. The same take featured on Band on the Run Archive Edition, but a radically different mix. Jimmy's guitar is higher in the mix and instrument separation is clearer. Nice job by Giles to get the most out of the, com the complex layered instrumentation. It's true. Interesting. That Yeah, that sounds like it's an essential companion. If, yeah. you, want blank, if you want to have a layout of here's the album what I've heard in the past isn't necessarily what I'm hearing now on the album, but um, I was interested in the fact that one hand clapping never was going well. It never came close to being an album in 19, in the mid 1970s. No. I guess it could have no. been. It could, but have it, been, never... it could have been, but in a way, why, you know, in the mid 1970s, Paul was in the business of writing and recording new music and putting right. it out. Right. And all of this stuff was old music with a few exceptions, you know. Right. Um, so there really was never an album in even even as a draft. Um, but now what went into uh, piecing this together here in 2024, which I'm assuming Paul did, uh, did he include every song, at least one performance, the best performance of every song nope. that was done in those four days? Is stuff nope. missing? Actually, it was eight days um because they uh they also went back in october and did some remakes um so i think it was eight days total but for instance on august 28th and 29th they recorded uh okay we we have power cut right but that mm -hmm. same day they also recorded lazy dynamite hold me tight um not the beatles hold me tight but the hold me tight that goes with power cut and lazy <laughs> dynamite whole lot of shaking going on oh my soul ooh wee baby suicide so there's 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 quite a there's probably i don't know if like if it's a whole other disc but if you include the other backyard stuff and the the songs that were left out uh in any version there's probably at least another disc worth of stuff 
that he could release. So you and Adrian were able to figure out all the songs that were recorded and how many takes of each song? And and how did you find that out? Not necessarily how many takes, but um, we've seen the recording documentation. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that. <clears throat> um, <laughs> but we, yeah, we have... Um, we have the documentation that basically shows what was done on what day, uh, sometimes how many takes. I do know that because um, Adrian was on the Two Legs mm-hmm. podcast, a fantastic interview, which you should all watch. But Junior's Farm in particular was several versions edited together. Right. These yeah. two versions edited together. Are you talking about the one on one hand clapping? Yeah, that's on now. On it's, one hand it's several versions put together. And it's 1985 not, is 19, or I should say 1985, uh, to be formally correct, is uh, partly the original studio version and partly recorded at, at the one hand clapping sessions. It's kind of a mix of things. And, and, and it's always been that way. I mean, on bootlegs too. Right. Um, for whatever reason, he decided, you know, to do that. There's another thing that's come up. Um, a few people have pointed out that they hear, especially during the bridge of Sally G, they can hear bleed from other instruments. Um, and someone pointed out today that it's especially clear on the center channel of the Atmos mix. Um, I haven't heard it myself, and we know that, you know, we have dates for them recording Sally G, starting on August 24th. Um, There's a couple of versions of it, Um, and he, I think he might have done it in the backyard as well. Um, That's what I thought this version was from, because it's just Paul on an acoustic guitar and nothing else. Well, right, but um, also on the first day, August 24th, the backyard was August 30th. On August 24th, it was like a setup day um, where Paul just did solo piano and guitar stuff while Litchfield set up his cameras. So uh, there was a Sally G from there too. Um, So what this instrumental bleed is of um, someone was saying today that they heard... uh, electric guitar and violin. So that makes it sound like it would be the the Nashville track stripped down. But I mentioned that to Adrian and Adrian synced up the Nashville track and this track. And at some point they go out of sync. There's a place where Paul sort of adds another beat um, on on this version. So it puts it out of sync with the Nashville version. But, you know, if this is a stripped down Nashville version, it could be a different take. It's definitely a different vocal, you know. Anyway, so. Has anyone tried to play any of these backwards to see if there's any? <laughs> Not you yet. Know, Paul you know, we're taking our time. <laughs> It was John's idea. I'm not dead, you know. <laughs> um, so the album we have today was a 2024 creation. This was not something that had form 50 years ago. Uh, Paul has cherry picked what he, I'm guessing it was Mc- Paul who chose the tracks that we're hearing now as what is now the definitive uh, document of one hand clapping. And if he wants to be generous and do a 10th anniversary expanded a deluxe edition, there's plenty of material uh, still sitting in the can That's from right. those sessions at Abbey Road in 74. Okay. I thought so, but, you know, just curious as I was listening. Hmm. I have so many questions to ask Alan when we do the show about one hand clapping. So uh, do, do you guys want to... Uh, single out some tracks that are highlights for you? Do you want to go that route? Um, I think you know, we should probably just say what we think of this collection and the performances. Which is just about what I just said, right? You want to... No, I, didn't say... <laughs> I didn't say pick out our favorites or anything. Oh, like okay. That. Um, 
You know, I like the rockers, like, you know, uh, Junior's Farm and Soily oh, yeah. and High, High, High. High, High, High is a great closing track for this collection. Um, it's, you know, it they're really together. Jimmy's playing is really good throughout this. And in the stereo mix, he's, you know, basically on the left channel. I mean, they've, they've, they've done a really nice kind of spaced out production. Um, in a way, I, I kind of like in this one, I, I so far like the stereo mix more than I like the Atmos mix, but um uh, they were that lineup was and i think it's getting it's it's going to get its due now because really other than junior's farm and one or two other tracks you never really we never really heard the jeff Britton lineup mm -hmm. uh and um from you know watching the old bootleg clips of them doing jet through the years i always thought he sounds like he's a powerhouse of a drummer and mm -hmm. and that really comes through when listening to the album and on other songs that, uh, you know, he may have been a rather straightforward uh, when it came to technique, at least in these performances, but wow, they were, he was a rock solid powerhouse of a drummer and the band was great. It's too bad that they couldn't stick around a little longer. You know, it's funny about Jeff Britton uh, getting off topic just for a second. A few years ago, I was digging around in a record store uh, and uh, used record store and I picked up this I don't know why I picked the album up it was by a band called Rough Diamond hmm. and, and why on earth I grabbed the album I don't know but I turned it to the back to find that Jeff Britton was the drummer of Rough Diamond and this was after Wings this was in 1976-77 uh, uh, and it was a band that featured um, David Byron from Uriah Heep and Clem Clemson from Humble Pie, Jeff Britton from Wings was the drummer, and they did one self-titled album in 77. Um, and uh, I was like thrilled. I just loved, I picked it up. What is this? Holy smoke. Uh, and it was pretty, not a bad album. Mm -hmm. Got ruined in, in, in some water damage here at home. But yeah. uh, so that's one of the places Jeff Britton went after Wings was in this band rough diamond from one album uh just to get off topic for a second now we come back uh to uh one hand clapping so let's dig in and uh talk about the songs the performances and what we liked maybe didn't like about the what we have now hmm. could i just say before i i talk about one hand clapping because i wanted to look it up myself since we brought up Genius Farm and Sally G <clears throat> being recorded in Nashville, Walking in the Park with Eloise, which was the song that Paul's father wrote as an instrumental, Jeff Britton plays on. Right, right. Looking up uh, Luca Parasi's excellent book right here, Music is Ideas, because it has the lineup of all the musicians, although Jimmy is not on that. Um, and the other instrumental, which was the B-side of Walking in the Park with Eloise, Jeff Britton is playing on, Bridge on the River Suite. Okay. So, so until it was more Mars was released, What's it that? was a Junior's Farm single, and it was the Country Hands single, which right. were the only things from the Jeff Britton lineup that ever came out. And then Jeff's on some of Venus and Mars, and right. that's it. And now this is the first time that an entire album is dedicated to that, to that lineup. Right. Yeah. I think this really sort of indicates Jeff in a way, you know, because, because we, we haven't, as you say, heard that many wings things with him on it, but, but this kind of, in a way, gives us a, a much fuller picture of where he fit in to, mm -hmm. to wings or, you know, how, what wings could have been, uh, you know, if he had stayed. I think he was a very aggressive drummer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fills in there where there normally wouldn't be, like in Jet. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're used to Paul's drumming in Jet, there's more that Jeff does. He's busier as a drummer. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly on Junior's Farm, high, high, high. There's a lot more drumming going on on this version. But um, this collection is just absolutely stellar for me because one thing you have to point out is Paul's vocals are off the charts here. It's among the best that I've ever heard. 
and it's so powerful. His screaming at the end of certain songs is so wonderful. Um, it just seems like, and I'd be curious to find out, you know, based on the notes that Adrian put together in the McCartney Legacy Volume 2, um, if he does have, I know you said you don't know how many takes of certain songs, but I would imagine that Paul picked the best takes of each because, you know, if if this was a live performance in the studio and Paul sounded this good and so perfect, you know, it's amazing. It, there's a looseness to this, and yet the band is tight at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know, this could work as a live performance, like you said, Alan, a live performance in the studio, and there's an excitement level here in part because she's so used to, to the studio versions of songs saved from Ben on the Run, that any slight difference in the vocals or in the arrangements, you welcome, and it sounds really fresh that way. Right. And Paul's vocals are just so great all throughout. I mean, I was listening to Blue Moon of Kentucky, where it's just, he sounds so natural doing this. He's holding the high note at the end, which, you know, it just sounds so perfect for the recording. Um, the rockers, like you said, Alan, are outstanding. Junior's Farm, high, high, high is, and he he repeats the second verse of high, high, high here, which that kind of surprised me. But um, I think if radio stations that are classic rock stations played some of these versions, and people would be hearing them, and they're saying that's not the version I'm I'm used to, they'll like this version definitely for sure. It's just so lively. Um, and it gives you a taste of what the band would have sounded like if they were live in concert. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like this version of Bluebird with the introduction, which doesn't just start with the vocals. You have those descending notes on the guitar leading to the first verse. The harmonies on Bluebird are just perfect. Um, Soily, oh my God, Soily rocks. It really <laughs> rocks. And um, we just did a show on my other podcast, Talk More Talk, where we were all in agreement. Paul, bring back Soily in your live set. It's just so good. This version, and I've always loved the version from Wings Over America. Um, Bed on the Run sounds great. Live and the Die sounds great. 1985 is the only real disappointment for me because I love hearing Paul alone on the piano doing it. And I wish the entire version was just him on the piano mm -hmm. instead of going into the release version. Although a plus on that is that he sings live over the recorded version of 1985. So you're hearing him scream a bit towards to what you're used to hearing on, on the band on the run version. Um, let me roll it. Let me roll it as a song that I've gotten so tired of because Paul does it. Uh, just about all of his tours i wish he'd give it a rest and yet you hear this version and i'm loving it because it's it's different um paul's vocals are great the arrangement is slightly different and um it just it's just so powerful as a studio recording this way as it was on ben on the run mm -hmm. like i said just the if there's a slight difference in the recording it's exciting um yeah. and uh junior's farm's great sally g was a real treat i had no idea that there was this all acoustic version of just him on acoustic guitar and nothing else um tomorrow is a bit of a treat although it's too short i had no idea this recording was made it's a slower kind of i don't know if you want to call it gospel -y version um and it works that way i just wish that he had done a full version of it the version of go now is great Wow yeah. is fantastic. And Paul's doing a lot of screaming on there. Uh, and I don't know if you noticed, but the introduction of wildlife, the world wild applies to you and me is actually Denny Lane singing it instead of Paul, mm -hmm. which was a nice little, you know, bonus there. And like I said, hi, hi, hi is, is wonderful. Um, I'll give you a ring is fantastic. I love the whole piano bit there. Um, and it's interesting because when it first came out as the B-side of Take It Away, I had read that Paul used the backing tracks from 1974 and mm -hmm. then asked uh, a clarinetist, Tony Coe, to do the clarinet part for the version that came out as the B-side of Take It Away. And I guess it's completely new vocals from Paul on uh, I'll Give You a Ring there. But it was a great song back then. 
all of you is a nice treat. Let's love. I'd like to hear a full version of that. It's a nice song that he gave for Peggy Lee. It's just too short here. Um, it's nice to have Let It Be in a Long and Winding Road. There, there are short versions. You know, you're not going to say these are definitive versions of those songs, yeah. but it's nice to have other versions. Uh, and the Long and Winding Road is a medley with the, uh, Lady Madonna. You know, but overall, between Paul's vocals, hearing the band, and yes, Jimmy does some great guitar work. I think his guitar work on My Love is kind of restrained, you know, because maybe Paul said to him, you got to play it the way that Henry McCullough played it. Um, and but on all the other lead guitar work on, on the album, on the rockers, it's fantastic. So it's a lot of highlights on here. And I would say definitely it's Paul's vocals, the sound quality, which is absolutely stunning. Um, and even though I haven't heard it yet, I've heard that the backyard tapes, the six songs sound absolutely incredible. So between the the production on it, Paul's vocals and hearing the band developed right here, it's it's a sensational treat overall. Alan? Yeah, there are these couple of things, let's love in all of you that are, you know, Paul sort of, uh, if he were writing standards, you know, standards in the old sense of, you know, Rogers and Hammerstein or, uh, right. you know, let's love actually Peggy Lee recorded and he, um, he had written it and recorded a demo and went to LA and produced her recording of it just like on his way to Nashville. It's not quite on the way. It's a little out of the way, actually. But uh, but that was that's actually such a part of this period, too. And and the other thing to look at when you look at this track list is this is August. He didn't really uh write everything he was going to use for Venus and Mars until close to the end of the year, you know, and while it was while he was on vacation before they went back into the studio to start working on it, that he wrote out everything, you know, all the lyrics and, uh, you know, and, and basically had the whole album, including the sequence, you know, the sequence on, on that one, wasn't held until the end. Like, let's see what we have and what order we should put them in. He knew exactly what that album was going to be before they went into the studio. And yet at the time of one hand clapping, there are none of those songs here yet, you know, yeah. but, but there is let's love, which, mm. you know, was, it's, it's kind of a really interesting period for him that, um, that doesn't get explored much. And, I got to say, you know, from our point of view, just about to come out with a book about this period or in, with this period in it, um, this is a, a kind of a, a great little bonus, you know, because now it won't be just us writing about a bunch of stuff that didn't get released. Here it is. You can listen. Right. Mm. So thanks, Paul. And I'm thinking about that's <laughs> love because you were talking about Paul writing standards that would have fit on Kisses on the Bottom. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? And, and all of you as well. Yeah. And I had mentioned on Talk More Talk, and one of the other co-hosts let me know. I, it was on Michael Parkinson's show. I just don't remember the exact year. I think it was around the time of Driving Rain. Might have been. Uh, but Paul did the song on the piano of something that he had just made up when he was in his apartment in new york and he's looking at it central park and he's is very much in that style of all of you yeah. you know it, you should try and find that on youtube mm. it's, it's another song that you hear and it's like why didn't you try and finish this this would make a really good song all of you would have made a really good song finished um let's love was a finished song and you know i, I love Peggy. an appearance was from um December 1999. Okay. So Run Devil Run Time. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so Darren, we haven't heard much from you. I've been Yeah, there are just a couple of things, a couple of songs here that I have I have questions for the two of you about. 
uh, all of you, this is a really the first time we're hearing it, if I'm not mistaken. It hadn't come out anywhere else. Whereas it's on the it, McCartney it years. Love. I'm sorry? Uh, the McCartney years DVD, remember that? DVD oh, right. with a okay. lot of his promos and yeah no i had for, totally forgot that uh let's love i know came out as a peggy lee song was a first song on the album let's love 1974 um there was one other one here i think i had a question about um yeah i guess i guess i'm gonna love you too with the end of the backyard um i only listened to the backyard once uh i'm gonna love you too was a tune i had a question about we know peggy sue in fact there's a clip of paul doing peggy sue that is on the uh mid 80s documentary film right the paul mccartney special which came out after press to play was released yeah. and there's a snippet of paul performing outside peggy sue on an acoustic guitar so that would have to be this Mm -hmm. uh outside of abbey road backyard of abbey road studios now on uh, on the seven inch record 20 flight rocks the other one plus you get uh another version of blackbird uh on the backyard disc and uh but uh, i'm gonna love you too and blackpool were the two that i was curious about um on their history uh if there is a history for those songs when it comes to to Paul and Wings. There yeah. was, uh, I, I, with Blackpool, I remember seeing that as a potential B-side that Paul was going to release. If um, The Man had been a single from Pipes of Peace, I believe it was going to be Blackpool as the B-side. Really? So okay. was considering that. Huh. Blackpool is kind of a joke song. Um, and I think we dealt with it in volume one. Um, if only it had an index, you could look it up. <laughs> Um, uh, it basically, there is a, a, a company called Bamforth, I think in, in Yorkshire that makes, um, uh, uh, postcards with sort of slightly racy in an old fashioned way, pictures of, you know, women in bathing suits and, and whatever. And uh, it was on one of Paul and Linda's trips, um, I think think she probably was pregnant with Stella at the time. Uh, they stopped in Blackpool and Paul came up with this. And it really was just a joke song. If you listen to the lyrics, you know, <laughs> I like him, you know. <laughs> Short, I like him tall, I like him heavy it's yeah it's uh you know it's about basically all of these women on the bamforth postcards um because they were sold at resorts like blackpool and uh and and um he then went to bamforth later uh i think for when wings toured england in 73 uh he had bamforth make him a poster for the tour it was it wasn't a, a girl in a bikini or anything it was a it was a guy a, sort of like an old-fashioned guy in a strange suit if i recall but um yeah the that's that's the roots of blackpool and it it, it always struck me as like completely a throwaway and yet it's obviously something Paul likes because he would sort of bring it up every now and then, like suicide, which was goes back to 1956, and suicide was in in this batch too. But it's uh, I, I don't it's not included on the wow. album. But if you if you listen to you know going through writing these books, I've been listening to you know all of his demos that have been out there or that we could get our hands on, and. It, it seems like almost any time he's sitting at a piano, suicide comes up, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's on the so-called piano tape, you know, that has been bootlegged as the piano tape. It, uh -huh. It's on, on, on quite a number of other demos too. It's just something that obviously means a lot to him because it's one of his first songs. And uh, so he, he plays through it. Every time a tape recorder is running, it seems. Well, that's an exaggeration, of course. <laughs> All right. Um, it, I'd like to ask you, Alan. Um, 
I don't know if you can actually admit this. Have you heard all this stuff from um, one hand clapping that Adrian has documented? Have uh, the two of you heard it all? Well, all the stuff that he's documented is, you know, he's talking about the differences between versions that have come out either on the archival boxes or on bootlegs. We've heard some tracks that haven't been released, but not an awful lot. And they're not that different from what's been bootlegged. Like we have asked, he, he had acetate struck for all the band members. It was like a double album's worth of acetates. Um, not the same as this. And uh, we've heard that. So, but we haven't heard all the raw tapes, you know, that's um, hasn't been available to us. But there's a lot of stuff bootlegged and there are the archival box releases. So it's been trickling out until now. And now here's a, a big, big flood of it. Uh, and, and it would be kind of cool if he put out another disc's worth because there were those other songs. It'd be good well, that's the 10th anniversary expanded uh, box set reissue that's coming. Um, one thing, I, can I say one, one thing that, it's like the only real disappointment for me. I love the fact that the backyard tape is on here, but I've had a bootleg of the backyard tape for many years. And my favorite moment in there is when he's doing all of his Presley songs towards the end. He does Loving You, and he also does um, We're Gonna Move. Yeah. And those weren't included here. I don't know why they had to put a seven inch. You could have put another 12 inch vinyl on here <laughs> with the whole thing. I don't know why most of the time we get everything in piecemeal with him. Why couldn't he just put the whole thing out? Mm -hmm. Anybody who loves the stuff that he does acoustically on the backyard tapes would love the rest of it. And Sweet Little 16 was also another one that's that wasn't put on here that's part of the backyard tape. Yeah. Yeah, he should sit down with Yoko and Sean. <laughs> And have them give him a you know a little talk about what a really great reissue set is like. You know, I mean, we're gonna get six discs of stuff from Mind Games. You know, I'm not sure I'd necessarily want Paul to do it the way they do it entirely, like you know the elemental mixes and the documentaries and all that. I mean, that's kind of interesting. I'd rather have just more outtakes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh but yeah you know look he could have put out you know the way the beatles had the red and the blue he could have put out one hand clapping as a two disc set uh -huh. and backyard tape as a two disc set the other hand could have called it yeah <laughs> the other hand clapping <laughs> or just have one one vinyl of just the acoustic guitar and one vinyl of just the piano, whatever he did on piano. Yeah. You're my thoughts about about uh, the uh, some of my highlights. I gravitate towards the rockers uh, because they're so powerful. And hearing Soily in the studio, a song that has never been released in studio form. But yeah. no, my favorite things were the, more of the the upbeat stuff. I, I really like Let's Love. Did a little investigating on eBay, thinking of getting Peggy Lee's album. Uh, now to go uh, to have it in context. I'm just overall blown away by the concept of a Wings album in 2024. Never thought that would happen. And there, here it is. I got to say one thing, though, my lone criticism is the album cover. Well, I think that was Litchfield's, Litchfield's drawing of, uh, you know. Could have done a better record. Right? <laughs> Could have come up with something a little more exciting. I really didn't like the cover. Wanted to get the T-shirt, but I'm like, I don't like the artwork. So anyway, um, so I happy. Like, you know that if for anyone who gets uh, Paul McCartney's email blasts, you know, with uh, whenever he's he's had several that have featured one hand clapping, and and those have sort of an animated GIF where the you know, the wings are like moving <laughs> kind of like, right, okay. yeah, yeah. If, yeah. If, they, if they could have uh, done that, you know, maybe like the stone satanic majesties cover with, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But uh, no, it's just so so exciting to have a Wings album in 2024 and uh, a period of Wings that has not been properly documented is now out the Jeff Britton period of 1974. And uh, uh, just also to reiterate something that Ken said earlier on, I love um, the, the, the life that's injected into the wildlife songs towards the end of one hand, one hand clapping um, wildlife tomorrow. Um, is there a third one here? I have it notes here. No, those two. Uh, just great to hear those versions. Slightly different takes on what we heard on the Wildlife album. Um, all told, just a, a, a big surprise, a pleasant surprise uh, that this would come out. And makes you wonder, gee, I wonder what else is possibly brewing out there that could come out uh, that would... Uh, uh, be such a special thing to have. So share your thoughts with us down below about one hand clapping. And uh, I guess that brings us to the end uh, of this edition of Things We Said Today. We have some very cool things planned for you in the weeks to come. We're not going to give it away now. Just going to say keep an eye on our Facebook page. Keep an eye on all things Things We Said Today because I think you'll like what we have coming as we make our way through the summer uh let's put a wrap on things uh, my cat beansy paid us a visit a little while ago uh beansy is really annoyed at me because he has not eaten so i have to feed beansy so before just a couple more minutes beansy let's go around the horn and uh find out what's doing in your world ken start with you Okay, if anyone would like to get in touch with me directly, you can email me at everylittlething at att.net. You can also friend me on Facebook at Ken Michaels. Um, the other podcast show, for which I'm a co-host, Talk More Talk, with Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo. We just did a show on one hand clapping and our thoughts about it. You might want to check that out on our YouTube channel, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And that show is also available on all, all the audio platforms like things we said today is on my own YouTube channel called Ken Michaels radio, which makes no sense. Why am I still calling it radio when it has nothing to do? You know, with I was thinking about asking you that today. I'm writing it down going, <laughs> why is he called this? Ken yeah. Michael Green? Maybe I'll change it to Ken. <clears throat> my most recent show had Daryl Easley on returning <laughs> the editor of record collector magazine and, they put out this issue back in January, all exclusively on Paul's solo career. And um, Owen Lynn appeared with him. Owen, uh, you know, from having written a book on George Harrison called George Harrison in the 70s. He's a freelance rock journalist. And the two of them were there together to do a what I call the deeper you go show. This is a new idea of mine where I ask guests to pick either the Beatles as a group or one of them individually in their solo careers and list 10 deep tracks, all non-hits that are favorites of theirs and why. So Daryl and Owen both shared 10 songs apiece. And I also had uh, an interview with Al Romas, who is... An old friend of mine from my college days at the New York Institute of Technology in Old Westbury. And um, we were both on the radio station, WNYT. And when I started doing my Beatles show there in 1982, it ran for a little more than a year. I had a co-host, Ed Ryan, who left the show. And since I wasn't sure whether I was going to continue doing it solo or whether I should get another co-host, Al filled in for a few shows. And he was my co-host, and it's the first time we've done a show together since 1983. And so it was a blast to have him on. We had him doing what I call a number nine dream show. And it was on John Lennon, where I picked three categories, like best vocals from John of all time, best songs that John covered, Beatles and Solo of all time. And I think it was his favorite uh, John Lennon lyrics of all time, whether it be a song or a line from the song. And so that's why I call it number nine dream. Three answers from three categories, three times three, you get nine answers. 
It's a number nine dream show. So I had those two shows in the last couple of weeks. Check them out at Ken Michaels Radio. And please subscribe to the channel. Um, my radio show, Every Little Thing, which is on some 50 radio stations. Every radio station can run a different show because they have access to about 180 shows that I've done. But if you want the easiest way to listen to my radio show on the Beatles, Every Little Thing, which has thematic sets, Hits, deep cuts, new releases, all kinds of stuff, cover versions, family members. It's all thrown together in this show called Every Little Thing. Um, the easiest way to listen to that is on WFDU's website. That's Fairleigh Dickinson University. And they post in their archive page the last two shows of mine that they aired. And they each are available for two weeks. So you have two weeks to catch each show wfdu.fm is the url for that click on the archival page uh type in every little thing and you'll have the last two shows there also on my website kenmichaelsradio.com uh you can always check the beatles trivia page every couple of weeks i have a new trivia question and with Ringo Starr's birthday coming up, it's a Ringo Starr trivia question. One of the new things I'm giving away is the new CD of demos of Tom Evans from Badfinger. This just came out from the folks at YNT Records. 21 tracks in total. You might recall just recently I gave away this CD of Pete Ham demos called Gwen Gardens. It's also from YNT Records. Excellent collections of both pete and tommy and i also have now one copy to give away of um this tribute to pete ham called shine on and that's also from ynt records this is a two cd collection various artists all covering pete ham music so if you're a big bad finger fan you probably know about these releases but you might want to check this out there's a lot of great people on here dennis dyken from the smithereens melanie who just passed away. She did a cover of Without You. Could be the last thing she recorded, certainly one of the last things that she recorded. Our friend Fernando Perdomo is on here. All kinds of great musicians. This is called Shine On. You can win that on my website. Just go to kenmichaelsradio.com, click on the tab that says Trivia, Beatles Trivia and Games, and figure out the answers I'm looking for at my Ringo Starr Trivia for his birthday, which is coming up very soon, July 7th. And um, I think that's everything. All right. Thank you, Ken. And Alan? Okay. I'll be brief because I love cats and I can't stand Darren's poor cat not having his dinner. So you can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, do check out the McCartney Legacy page because there is, you know, Adrian's rundown of uh, of the edits on this uh, one hand clapping set. Uh, you can reach all of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Uh, follow us on Twitter at, at things we said fab. Uh, the shows are on YouTube, uh, on Podbean, on Apple, everywhere fine podcasts can be found. We're there. Um, but we kind of like it if you watch the YouTube ones. I don't know why. Um, maybe we're narcissists. <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah. And then there is our group Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today video podcast. Has a right. link Next, like this. With that look. Um, we're going to, I, which Ken and Alan don't know this yet, but uh, soon I'm going to pick your brains about a point where a date where the old Facebook page goes because it's going to go soon. So please, if you have not liked the new Facebook page, Alan, the button again with the logo, it's called Things We Said Today Video Podcast. That's going to be our home on Facebook. The old page is going to go. Yeah, and we post links to all the shows on that page and Ken yeah, posts. You don't want to his various contests. And so, uh, you know, you should definitely tune into it. Anywho. Uh, thank you, Alan. By the and way, she, she yes. Alan showed his button. Alan doesn't realize I'm wearing my McCartney legacy button right here. I thought that looked familiar. <laughs> I don't have one. Where'd you get it? I do. 
have a McCartney legacy at the fest. You were giving him out. At the Fest for Beatles fans, you were giving him out. Hmm. I didn't get one. Hmm. Hurt. Right here. Deep down, I'm we'll hurt. We'll try to get you one. We'll try to get you one. Hopefully. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, without revealing anything, do you guys already know what colors the future books are going to be, volume three and on? Uh, Adrian and I were saying that the third one will be green, but, you know, we'll see. All right. Anyway, uh, for me, uh, just to repeat again, uh, WFUV's Night at the Brooklyn Museum is Thursday, July 11th for the Paul McCartney Photo Exhibition exhibit. Uh, that will be happening on Thursday, July 11th. Uh, this is going to be a private after hours tour of the exhibit um, when the museum is closed to the general public. And then there'll be, uh, you know, we'll have some drinks and chat a bit about um, whatever comes up in conversation after the tour of tickets. Very limited. WFUV.org slash Paul photos. And even if you can't and or don't want to come, check out the website just to find out what's going on uh, at the Brooklyn Museum uh, in Brooklyn, New York City. Uh, as for me on the radio, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning, uh, and then Saturday afternoons from 1 till 4 uh, at WFUV 90.7 FM. You could stream us anywhere. You don't have to be in the New York metropolitan area, WFUV.org. We also have an app. You can download and listen to us on the app. Um, I gave you my hours. Two Facebook pages, Darren DeVivo. And then there's another page, uh, which is Darren DeVivo, WFUV, uh, DJ and Beatles podcast, something like that. But uh, join one and I'll hook you up with the other and we'll be in contact uh, with each other. And that's about it. I think uh, that's plenty. Uh, uh, actually, I know. Um so for Ken Michaels, for Alan Cozen, uh, I'm Darren DeVivo. Thanks so much for hanging out and talking one hand clapping with us here on Things We Said Today. And we'll see you uh, next time in a couple of weeks. Later. Later.